Okay, uh, welcome to the November 23rd uh, meeting of the Infrastructure Committee. It's 1.03 p.m. Uh, and let's get started. All right. First item of business on the agenda is the minutes for October. We're going to have a chance to put those over. Do yes. you have any comments or concerns about them? No. Okay. All right. Next, we have uh, <laughs> is information items for discussion, but I don't see anything on the uh, agenda for that. Uh, no, as far as I know, uh, we only have action items to uh, really discuss today. No, uh, I guess the closest thing to information items we have is uh, talking about you know outstanding borough projects. Okay, which is later on the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, potential action items for borough council. All right. Uh, I assume we're going to stay with the order we've got here. Um, first item is the, the updated use and occupancy ordinance. Right, yeah. So, uh, as discussed with this committee, in order to implement a sidewalk inspection program, there are really two ordinances that the borough needs to pass. One being a, um, a update to our use and occupancy ordinance to make clearly legal the process we're already doing of inspecting sidewalks as part of the UNO because our existing ordinance was uh, unclear about that. Um, so that's what this ordinance, the primary goal that would be, would to basically bless, you know, and, and authorize what the borough is already doing, where when someone is going through a UNO that we can, um, can inspect the sidewalk and make them fix it as part of that. Uh, <coughs> So that is that component, and then the other component I think is later up is the next item on the agenda. Right. So um, I wanted to see if this group had any questions or comments about the proposed ordinance before it made its way to Borough Council. Well, I might not, it kind of depends, because now you're explaining the principal purpose of it is, and that's, um, I, had, I had a bunch of questions about the use and occupancy permits with respect to lease, leased rental properties. Mm -hmm. um, and, but part of my question, they're kind of, it's kind of twofold. So um, where are the questions? I guess on the one hand, I had, uh, oh, yeah, I have them written out somewhere, but it's on my different, I'm sorry. Can you just hold on a second while I find the copy? Sure, sure. sure. One. Oh, come on. Do you want to go first, Michelle? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, so just one question about the UNO is we had we had discussed for a couple of years with shade tree also adding in shade tree uh, like inspection mm -hmm. as part of this process but anyway I'm just wondering if we're having the UNO redone if we could fold that in I, mean, if I haven't I haven't checked back with shade tree to see where they are with all that but that's something that like under um, you know, our previous public works mm -hmm. uh, manager, we had in, in mind a, a system where, as part of that process, home, new homeowners that wanted a tree could indicate that on the form and it could be kind of fed to the shade tree commission so that they could have an automatic, you know? Yeah, we could definitely, we could do that without the uh, ordinance. Um, okay. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Uh, if you send me some of the details on that program, uh, me and Jeff, our uh, public works manager, can definitely look into getting that going again. Okay, great. So that doesn't need to be in the ordinance because that's no, just an administrative ordinance requirement. Yeah. I think that would be something that the inspector would. I mean, because this doesn't have the, the guidelines for the inspection. This has just when it's going to be triggered, mm -hmm. and, you know, the legal basis for having an inspection, not like all of the things the inspector is going to look out for. Yeah. All right, that's a separate. That'll be a separate. Uh, rules or something, so that might be something that the inspection mm -hmm. would... Uh, let's see, actually... Right. Uh, I think it actually does play out what they're inspecting. Well, it, there's, a, there's the, okay. the sidewalks. I mean, what's a... No, it's really, it could be... You know, there, there's, there's the sidewalk area, There's it lays out what they're going to inspect, which is the gutters, the sidewalk, and the, uh, the curb, but that's, that's separate, right? right? So the 9A is really broad. Yeah. And I think it doesn't it leave room for us to determine what it's going to be. It's, I forget the exact language. Uh, Barrage will inspect all units for compliance 
Well, I, that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, sure. with, with the items set forth on the use and occupancy inspection form. Right, which we don't and, have. Here. And all other applicable part of common law and federal laws. Yeah, so that's so first, the first that, one we don't I wasn't have. sure what and all other applicable laws could encompass. It seems like it could be really broad. It could be like the entire UCC. I'm not, but I mean, it's not. No, I, I assume there's some boundaries on that. <laughs> I know what yeah, it is. there would be. Um, well, it would mostly be the. Um, it wouldn't only really be the UCC because certain things would be grandfathered in and that sort of thing. Right. Um, with the um, property maintenance code, however, as listed in Section A on its own, that there's no grandfathering in with that. Right. You know, either you know your grass is cut or it isn't. You know, or what have you. Um, and Eric, if you have any thoughts on this between your engineering and zoning experience, feel free to uh, jump in on this conversation. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I was trying to get my mouse over. Um, yeah, so it, uh, it, the inspections really is governed kind of by the UCC, uh, which I don't get involved in too much, but the, the sidewalk uh, uh, and curb are usually the main items that uh, you know, we want to be looking at uh, from the fringe there. Yeah, so I think... Um I think any other laws, I mean, I can check with John Walco. I would imagine that might just be like a legal catch-all kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean, it says applicable. That does a lot of work in that paragraph. I just, you know, I'm sure you saw it through, but I... Yeah, we're we're going to need to get the details of the property maintenance code well, and the, yeah. uh, that, that permitting structure in place before we actually do this. Right? Yeah, okay, it's, that, it's another step. Those are a lot um, of my what, questions. What I can <laughs> share with you all is I can show you the existing form because we are doing you know, inspections, like I said, just this ordinance would it specifically <coughs> include the, the sidewalk component to it. So I'll just go to the borough website here. And do a little bit of lag here. There we go. Oh, actually, you know what, for those of you on Zoom, I will share my screen. This is the borough's existing uh, use and occupancy form found from the borough uh, website. Uh, as I mentioned, all you know, we are currently doing curb and sidewalk inspection. Um, but we just wanted the ordinance to, um, you know, it's better reflect it. So, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit. When currently are we requiring this? Permit to be obtained. I mean, I know, but the property change ownership. I know yeah. that. Are there any other times? Any other? Not for residential property. Okay, so rentals do not trigger right. for any use not of that's really at present. Okay. Right, and that's so, why. Um, <laughs> that's why uh, public health and safety is talking about the uh, residential uh, rental inspection program. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But I do think this ordinance has a uh, language that would. Well, it, that it does. This is the nature that. of my questions is I'm trying to figure out how these things work together or whether they will work together. And I wasn't sure what the status of because I thought that the health and safety was working on that. Mm -hmm. So just, well, so right now, do we have a rental registration? We do not. So we don't have rental registrations or inspections. I guess it seems like once that is in place, that would supersede this. Upon rental lease of property. I mean, this enables the rental inspection. Yeah. This is, this is the enabling decision. Yeah. All right. So in other words, you will need to get a use and occupancy permit. Okay, I understand that. Okay, so it. Oh, all right. I, I, I get. I get what the purpose of this would be. Um, I think maybe a, a good way to think of that is a use and occupancy. 
will trigger any time that you have a change in you uh, you know, change in ownership of the residential and then when you have a rental property that's another it's like an additional inspection that gives you the opportunity to look at the property more often you know whatever interval that you're setting up yeah so i would think that well the the, the problem i saw here was that this was upon um the changing tenants or every two years whichever was sooner right mm -hmm. if rented continuously to the same tenant whichever occurs first but I was wondering what was going to, because there are a lot of properties in the borough, I think, that probably are long-term rentals that will continue to be, and I wonder what was going to bring them into this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it would be the requirement to register the rental, which right. presumably when mm -hmm. that's done, there'll be some penalty if you fail to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Once you've registered, that that will, that will trigger this. I just want to make sure that that's like clear, right? That that will, that will trigger your first requirement for this. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and then after that, it will be yeah. 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 changes are true. That makes sense. Yeah, we do want to bring all the rentals into the Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I had another question, but this may also happen under the rental inspection, or may, I guess it would happen there, because, I mean, basically, if in that two-year period, say, in an interim period, um, somebody would were, were report to the borough that there was an unsafe condition, right. um, and that would cause, you know, us to go out and inspect it, right. um, at that point in time, would there be an ability to rescind an existing occupancy permit until that condition was repaired, even you know, in between that two-year period? Does that need to be in this legislation? Uh, no, I don't think it would rescind an existing UNO. It would just be, there would be language for citations for um, failure to comply. But yeah. what if somebody has a substantial violation, we're just going to let them keep their use and occupancy permit in effect and find them? I'd have to look again, without, we don't have that actual, okay. yeah, that, I think you're a little bit ahead of where we're at in the process right now. Okay. Yeah. But those are, those are really the questions that are going to be covered by the, um, the actual uh, ordinance that would involve creating the residential inspection and rental program. Yeah, I mean, I think mm -hmm. once the legislative yeah. inspection program is put in place, it would be helpful to hook into this such that, I mean, suppose suppose a tenant called and uh, flagged a, a substantial like, violation or unsafe condition, and Kevin or somebody would go out and inspect it and find, oh my gosh, you know, over there, yeah, I was reporting this, but by the way, you know, look at this, and we can't get out of the fire escape, you know, and they won't come fix the door. By the way, there's a road Could they then, under this, could they then have authority to inspect more properly under the use of an occupancy permit? Or, or would that fall under the property inspection? Yeah, uh, well, here we go. Here's the relevant yeah. language in this ordinance here in 12B. At the expiration of the 12 month period or before that time, if requested by, well, it says requested by the unit owner, but I mean, I think if it was even a tenant, for rental property would be open to that. Oh yeah. The borough shall re-inspect the property for purpose of determining compliance with citations. If a, te if a temporary one has been issued, uh, oh no, that doesn't cover revoking it, never mind. Sorry. It sounded a lot more exciting than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> no, it, started, uh, I, it, it sounds to me like you're going to work through these things. It's a, yeah, yeah, I just want to emphasize for today. That was the only thing I was concerned about, that we didn't have process for getting long long-standing rentals into this system in the first place. And then I want to make sure that tenants have the ability to flag issues and sort of have a high alert, like if it really appears that there's more going on than just the one issue they flag, that we can, we can, we can, because this, this gives the borough authority to go in and do a pretty comprehensive inspection if it seems necessary. All right. So I just, mm -hmm. that's all, but that's really yeah. all the health and safety. No, that's, that's, that's a good time. point. And we can, certainly we can discuss um, the different, you know, options, whether it's, whether it includes fines and also a re-inspection or resending the UNO. Yeah. A whole range of tools. I agree with that. And, uh, but yeah, so the, the purpose of this ordinance for today, again, is just to uh, in, uh, make very clear the borough's legal authority to inspect sidewalks mm -hmm. as part of um, yeah. UNO inspection. I get it. Thank you for, um, let me say a little bit more, but I just want to make sure. I get it. I mean, it's, it's a substantial amount of code, though. This is not something that's currently in the borough code, so you know, we do need to look it over and make sure that it fits in. So, 
not a, it's not really a revision. This is this is new code. So, I mean, the, the question I had was looking at um, what happens if uh, a uh, a landlord or has just had an inspection and then has a change of tenant. Um, you know, because I mean, there's there's I know one of the uh, former illegal mm -hmm. Airbnbs has transitioned to monthly rentals. Mm -hmm. So if they were to do that under this system, they would have to get a new inspection every month. Right. Um, but even just if a tenant fell through or something, you know, you might have somebody who gets an inspection for a new tenant, and that right. tenant doesn't work out, and two months later they have another tenant. Um, so I, I think. A, no, they would be required, yeah, to re inspect, yeah. I mean, do we think that's necessary, or is it, uh, you know, perhaps we can allow, they can ask for a waiver if they've had a recent inspection? I don't know. There ought to be something. I'm not sure it's necessary to be constantly reinspecting the same property unless there's evidence that something is wrong with it. You know? In meaningful language, I don't really want to do waivers because I don't like having that sort of discretion administratively all the time. But maybe there's some language that, like, if you pass an inspection in the last six months or yeah. something like that. That was my thought as well. It. Six months is a good number. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's true because we have limited inspection resources. You know, well, I mean, and they'll be paying for it, yeah, but it, you know, know. It's, it's administrative costs for everyone. It's a burden for the borough, it's a burden for the property owner. Mm -hmm. It's not, it may not be necessary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think Michelle raised my other concern. Uh, so the, just to clarify, this, this, this ordinance allows for the uh, inspector to review the form plus the curves and sidewalks. Yeah. And the form can be revised. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of outside this process. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from the committee? Anything else, uh, Samantha, that we need to weigh in on this? Or is this I didn't see no, that was really good, actually. So, I mean, what I'll do is uh, I'll take uh, these comments and questions to the Burr Solicitor, and then that way when it's presented to, uh, well, it's up to you all, I mean, he can either answer those questions uh, when it's presented to Borough Council, or I can get those answers and bring it back to this committee before we pass this on to Borough Council. So I, I did talk about the six month thing with him. He thought that was our decision. Basically, that's a political decision rather than his decision. So, uh, and on that one at least, uh, it should probably go to Council, but the other ones, uh, and that Michelle, do you want him to weigh in? Mm -hmm. Do you want to show him up with a weigh in on your? No, I mean, I feel like uh, I, 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 he's probably thought about it. I just think we'd say looking ahead in order to integrate, you know, and make this work well with rental registration inspection programs or anything else that we need to add to make sure that, that they can, yeah. that is, would we ever want to call up the use and occupancy permit either um, as, as a penalty to rescind it temporarily due to a failure to comply with the rental inspection? Administration collection program, or, or in order to be able to do a more comprehensive, thorough inspection that we perhaps aren't going to give ourselves permission to. I don't know. If there, is there any need for them to sort of uh, be harmonized? It, it, so, is there any need to put anything language in here now in anticipation of that? There may not be. You may just probably going to say, no, I think this is fine, it stands alone. Registration and rental and inspection program can. The rental registration and inspection program can call on this as needed. It's, it's sufficient. That's fine. I just want to make sure we've thought, thought about it because I know he probably has. So that's all. Uh, yeah, and I'll plan that I'll, uh, I'll share what we talked about here today with John Walco and uh, he and I will have probably, you know, just a couple minor changes this ordinance for a council uh, at their meeting on December 15th to consider for advertisement. Okay. All right, next item are the uh, sidewalk maintenance regulations, which dovetail with uh, what we've just been discussing. Sure, I'll uh, pull that one up for the benefit of the Zoom crowd. So uh, this ordinance is not done yet. Um, Burris Solicitor at least wanted us to have something we could start to talk about today. And then he's going to go back and kind of finish flushing uh, out this ordinance for final review and all that. So again, uh, as we spoke about at previous meetings, the borough's existing sidewalk regulations 
The main challenge when it's going to come to actually doing a real inspection and enforcement program is we're very vague about mm -hmm. you know what a, you know what quality a sidewalk should be in. And looking at Lower Marion Township, which this ordinance was uh, modeled after, is that it provides for more uh, specific uh, requirements. So we'll just go through um, get past the definitions. So there's some comments from the solicitor in here. Um, there are some changes to some of the existing um, language about removing snow and ice to where it explicitly says a pathway three feet width as opposed to just saying clear to snow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of the general theme of this ordinance is taking areas where it's again kind of vague and giving us a quantifiable enforcement sort of tool here. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so some of the things we talked about is, you know, this language about in 446-5 that people can't, you know, pile stuff up on the, uh, can't put obstructions in the sidewalk and pile things up on the, um, on the sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> there's language that people also can't pile things up on parking areas to, uh, to call dibs on a parking spot. Mm -hmm. Uh, though actually I may tell the solicitor that should probably be amended because the borough does have the traffic cone uh, process so maybe some language you can't put anything in a parking spot except unless you have an approved borough uh, traffic cone reservation. Or a folding chair because this is Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to know that. <laughs> The folding chair stop on the side of the city. <laughs> All right. <you're> right. <laughs> uh, uh, it has language about not allowing um, uh, advertising on uh, on the sidewalk. Well, signs or banners. Um, that I want to ask you all about, like how strong of an enforcement or how strong of language do you want on that? Because I have noticed in the downtown area of the borough. People do put out like sandwich boards and um, some advertising sort of things. I guess who would say nothing that's a permanent sign or banner would be allowed to be put up in the borough sidewalk. Or that obstructs a clear path through the It's Samantha. Yeah, yeah. For the sandwich boards, I have um, my experience with them is usually we have some code languages other places to the effect of sandwich boards can be out front of a business as long as they're removed at the end of the business day and they can't obstruct you know, the free flow of uh, you know, pedestrians. Yeah, Eric, if you could um, if you could send me and John Walco that language, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, and then similarly, uh, you know, adding some stronger language about uh, trees and shrubs and that sort of thing blocking the uh, blocking the sidewalk. Also, the overhead clearance uh, is going to be changed per the solicitor's comment to be consistent with our shade tree uh, ordinance. Uh, Uh, when everything anything is in the way, the borough has the right to remove it. And the most important part here uh, for me is here's some new language. Uh, here we go. Here's some new language based again on the Lower Marion ordinance that explicitly mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, one four bench between blocks, a crack that's more of a half inch or more in width, or block where the concrete is falling, flaking, or crumbling. Um, so I think that's a lot better than the previous language, which I think just says something like if it's not in good condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I thought that was much better. A quarter inch in elevation, right. change in elevation. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Between blocks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the ultimate goal is to, is to 
define a tripping hazard, basically. Right. Exactly. It's right. And it can be measured with a yardstick by a public works crew. Exactly. Yeah. That will allow. Um, yeah. That one of the biggest things for that too is it will allow public works to be involved as opposed to having um, yerkes uh, do right. those inspections. Oh. Right. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> did that's we, a good method. Did, we, did, that, did the language about the height of shrubbery that's up joint, up, up next to but not overhanging a sidewalk yeah, stand? Let's, uh, let's go back to uh, that section. I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, some Sorry. Tree shrubs leaves another obstruction. Uh, looks like this uh, would remove that language. Okay. And just say, uh, you know, you can have whatever you want beside the sidewalk. It just can't intrude on, into the yeah. sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Unless that bothers everyone. I know it's like blocks the view, but it's it's, it's not in here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, the problem is just, you know, the roots of the hedge yeah. could be to the side of the sidewalk, but then the top of the hedge. Is oh yeah, it can't it can't do that. But some people will plant their hedges far away from the sidewalk that they grow with their form and they're right. beautiful. I hate to see them have to lock them down to whatever it was before. Like, it was like four feet or something, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Got a couple of them. Uh, sure. Let's see here. We'll make sure I'm done right. going through the review here. It, uh, it also specified the process, you know, so I think the homeowner would be issued the citation, and then if they don't right. do the work within 30 days, then the borough can do the work. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. And build them for it. Build the homeowner, or even put a lien on the property. To be honest, I mean, I don't know how many, it would depend on the extent of the work that we put a lien on it, because the cost to us to file the lien okay. versus the actual value of the work. You're right. Um, but like, we had to go and like replace a whole block, of, you know, whole property front of the sidewalk. Yes, we would absolutely lien someone. Uh, for that, but if it's just we had to fix like a you know single crack or single block or something, it probably we would have that option, but it probably wouldn't be worth it, you know, to the borough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we probably keep like an I guess what I consider an unofficial sort of lien on the property, to where at that property, and this will be the great thing about the MyGov software that we've uh, that F and A and all have talked about is the borough could keep track of internally of things like that without having to file a lien mm -hmm. and could deny permits or things yeah. like that to someone until they got compliant okay. uh, with those fees. Um, but uh, so my understanding is that sidewalks, you know, change in elevation can also be fixed by grinding the concrete down. So I've seen that in yeah. the town, okay. so it's level. You know, it doesn't have to be totally replaced necessarily. So. Yeah, here, there's the, the rest of the ordinance is uh, actually really specific about how to actually do the work. This whole section here, performance of work, gets into things like that. Uh, let's see here. Backfilling, respiration. And there, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can, either, you can grind stuff down. I've seen you can inject like this molding under the sidewalk to lift up, you know, part of it. You need to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, there's lots of, or you can just replace the block. There's there's lots of ways you can do it. Uh, yeah, our outdoor dining ordinance. Yeah, this is just other. other yeah, other relevant ordinance. regulations. Yeah. Uh, so my two comments are that, uh, by my reading, we're no longer allowing people to put their garbage out on the on the sidewalk or on the street. I don't see anything in there that exempt uh, uh, garbage containers. So. Yeah, we'll want to change that then. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like them in the sidewalk personally, but. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a bad idea to put them in the sidewalk but the streets are the only that's, that's what we do. Uh, and then the other the other thing is about the moving the tree clearance to sixteen feet rather than I, I think that's just a placeholder feet. number. Okay. Well I just worry I don't want to incentivize people to take down their trees. Like mm -hmm. say, oh my gosh, we gotta take all this down and I'll just take the tree down. So I don't know if there's a way to to say that again on these. Is that tree better be trimmed and not taken down? Yeah, is that that's good. Is that number taken from? 
clearance over a street for yeah. vehicles, and clearance over a sidewalk could be lower. Well, I think, I think Eric. The, uh, yeah, you're correct. The, the clearance over a street is probably, I think it's at 16 feet. Um, the sidewalk is usually more in line with like eight feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah like the, um, the current ordinance says uh, eight feet, I believe. Okay. Yeah, right now it says the minimum overhead height clearance of any tree branch shall be 16 mm -hmm. feet over any street or sidewalk. Yeah. That's the, that's what's in the language right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't mind that number. I just want to try to make sure it doesn't result in people taking trees down. I don't know how to, how to make that. Yeah, if there's a way that we can implement that. But. I guess I would say this, I mean, just from having to deal with, from the municipal perspective, having to take down tree limbs and take down, unfortunately take down trees, um, cutting tree limbs is way, way, way cheaper than actually removing a whole tree. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, and I'm also if someone thinking. were to remove a tree they would still fall under because it would, if it's affecting the sidewalk, it would almost certainly be in the right of way. I'm trying to imagine. Mm -hmm. I don't I mean, know. Do we, do we currently have something with preventing people from taking down trees in the right of way? Yeah. Well, we don't have the, the permit process that we want, right? Right. Not, not but yet. there, the shade tree ordinance does say that people aren't allowed to take down trees in the right of way without um, a permit from the borough to do so. Okay, right. good enough. Well, yeah. Yeah, good enough for this, good enough for this purpose. I'm not worried that I've got language in there. We're, we're working on improving it, so. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you. 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 Thank Sounds good. All right, so me and uh, John Walker will keep working on this ordinance, and um, if there's major changes to it beyond what we've talked about, it'll we'll bring it before this committee again. If it's you know just sort of pro forma kind of stuff and just implementing what we've talked about here, it'll go on to council. Sounds good. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're really been needed for a long time. I'm really I'm happy to see the. <laughs> so I'm excited for that. Yeah. Moving along, it's in our it's in the comp plan. <laughs> People, people complain about our sidewalks all the time. Yeah, and I'm, I'm uh, excited about the idea that you have a plan for how to sort of roll this out to public works by, you know, by operationalizing compliance. And so clearly, it's just a great idea. All right, next item. Consideration of proposal for office wiring and ethernet ports. Sure. So uh, based on some of the previous, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. Take, take your time. <laughs> Yeah, new uh, new technology here. All right. Well, for now, I don't want the meeting. It's just going to get to um, see my computer screen here. So we'll take advantage of that, and I'll pull up the uh, relevant information for everyone on Zoom. Um, so as the memo states, I'm not going to read the memo word for word here. We've talked recently at infrastructure about how to best do improvements to uh, borough facilities, notably 100 Conway, this building, and 80 Windsor. Um, looking through the uh, KCBA report, one of the items identified was to improve uh, data drops, which independently was something our IT uh, consultant had recommended to us. So before I even ever read the KCBA report, um, a few months back, our IT company had a subcontractor come to the building and uh, walk around and meet with borough staff to talk about the existing location of uh, data drop and outlets and all that sort of thing. And we received the, um, this proposal <coughs> that I'll put up here. To do, um, so Link Tech is the subcontractor, Images is our IT consultant, and uh, Michelle Bailey is our uh, is our point of contact at uh, Images. And uh, here's the scope of work that they identified. Um, they particularly were concerned about needing to do some rewiring for uh, doing a new uh, VoIP uh, system. 
That being said, we're on a belief system right now, and it generally seems to work fine with the wiring that we have. And the, um, uh, yeah, so, but that being said, this was uh, recommended by our IT consultant. It was a recommendation from the KCBA study. And it was in the um, list of projects that we talked about last month. Uh, KCBA said it would cost 25000 This proposal is for less than $7,000. So, um, so I'm in, I would be in favor of moving forward with it as part of the um, you know, improvements that we're talking about borrowing the money for, unless this committee has serious objections to that plan. Any chance an outlet where the owl is? <laughs> That's actually a pretty good idea. Um, yeah, the owl didn't exist when they did their uh, tour here, mm -hmm. um, but I think that would make the room flow a lot better. So that's a great idea. Speaking yeah. about tripping hazards, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have a bunch of cables running through here. Well, yeah, no, I think this is a, is a good. It's a good. Yeah, let's right. actually. I, I assume when staff's working from other places in the building, they could just rely on Wi-Fi. It's time, and that would be best to have. Let's see here. Using cables is a better solution, so all for it. Yeah, bear with me. Their labeling of our rooms is not uh, not necessarily the same language that we use mm -hmm. to how we label these uh, rooms in the borough. Admin side second floor is this room, mm -hmm. and it does include four. Uh, for uh, station installations, termination of existing uh, lines. Yeah, let me get more detail from them about what the stream is and make sure they do something that works with the owl. That's a good thought. Anyone else have any questions or concerns? Okay, uh, I think uh, we're happy to move this forward. Great. Uh, next is a consideration proposal for a new VoIP phone system. Uh, there we go. So uh, my thanks to uh, Michelle Carroll, who worked on putting together this research for you all. Um, so right now the borough does have a VoIP system through Comcast. There are two problems with that. Number one is Comcast is kind of expensive. And number two is the customer service from Comcast, or anyone who's ever had to call Comcast <laughs> or anything, is uh, pretty atrocious. Uh, it's legendary. <laughs> so uh, Michelle analyzed the current features we're using for the existing Bloop system in order to do apples to apples comparisons with uh, various vendors. And I'm trying to remember if the summary is in here or not. I know she got quotes from four, uh, four different vendors which are listed, well, let's see here, two of which mm -hmm. are listed here. These are the two lowest cost ones. Um, so Granite actually was the lowest um, uh, bid, and they're actually who we have our internet service through now. Uh, that being said, going back to customer service, uh, we've had a couple issues with the internet with Granite, and their customer service has been not to our liking. Um, so while they are the cheapest quote, um, we are actually recommending that the borough go with AT&T. Their price is much lower than what we're paying for, uh, for Comcast. Um, and we just uh, feel that the service we would get from them might be better than what we would get from Granite. Are, are you thinking about revisiting Granite for your internet? I, mean, I think I'm, once our contract is up with them, yeah, I think we would be. Because uh, otherwise, I don't want okay. All right. Yeah, and I think it's great that uh, Michelle did this research yeah. and this is going to yeah. save a lot of money. Save money. It's great. And it says no new wiring. Right. And that was something we did specifically talk to them about and factored in with that wiring proposal we just discussed is, you know, what sort of wiring we would need for um, uh, for the phone system. And, and AT&T felt pretty good with the wiring we had. So AT&T and Grant are also saving us some money on that wiring quote because that would have been more extensive if we had gone with uh, MMGs for uh, for the bleep. All right, so the MMGs, is that our managed IT? 
Yeah. And they also not, offer void. And we're not changing that though. No, we're not. We actually did an RFP for that right when I, um, Michelle started on before I started here and she concluded that RFP right when I uh, started working here. Okay. And Images was found to be the lowest, um, mm -hmm. lowest priced uh, vendor. And they're already familiar with the borough and they're yeah. already trained in all the stuff the police need for their stuff. And everything. That's a hard transition to make. It is harder. So I have a quick question that's not about this. I think this is great. Thank you, Michelle, again. But it made me think of something that I've always been curious about. When we have voiceover review, what are our like current failover? Like, like what options? And will they change <laughs> any, for when we move to, will they get better or worse or stay the same? So in other words, if the internet goes down, obviously, what happens now and will, will that stay the same? Sure. Like, um, so what I would envision and what I would hope is happening, but Michelle would know 100% for sure, is that when the phone system is down, calls get forwarded to someone's um, cell phone. Um, and the nice thing about ET&T mm -hmm. is these uh, soft seats that yeah. Michelle mentions are basically like if you wanted, the, you know, you don't, you're not tied to a specific device mm -hmm. to answer mm -hmm. uh, phone calls. So if the system went down, then yes, calls could be forwarded to like my cell phone or Michelle or mm -hmm. Missy or whatever. They are personal devices. I thought I assumed it was going to stay. It was. I just wanted to make sure that that, that was going to continue to be the case, and for outgoing calls too, right? Yeah. yeah it's a, yeah. The nice thing about um, that this system as well is you can make outgoing calls mm -hmm. and like um, not like a nefarious way, but you can like mask the number to be like the borough's yeah, well, number, so that way you're not like everyone mm -hmm. that have like your personal phone number. Yeah, of course, and that makes complete sense. And so that's if our internet connectivity goes down. What if there's like a broader like they, in other words, they keep this service up and running even if there's sort of a, a more regional outage. Right. right. There's still some capacity to have phone connectivity. Well, the challenge would be like even if their service is up, if if by regional outage you mean if like both cell and internet are down, then 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 we're there's nothing what? you can do. Cell so, and internet. Oh, cell and internet. No, I'm just talking about. Yeah, if it's just internet, then yeah, their no, service no, would no, still work again. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Yeah, it'll go to our cell phones. Okay. All right, so the proposal is to go with uh, ET&T. Anybody mm -hmm. have any objections to? Okay, so go ahead. All right, we'll so actually we'll, um, we'll, we'll present it to council as part of the consent agenda. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and then the last action item is the uh, Hanson Court Streetlight Pillars. Read us. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I've learned a lot about that. I'm glad we uh, record the borough meetings. I got to go back and, uh, and watch uh, some of those. Um, so, to recap for the public and everyone here, uh, last year the borough, uh, borough council uh, decided to take ownership of the pillars at Hanson Court, uh, as well as the other streetlights and the stormwater uh, any stormwater facilities over in Hanson Court. Uh, these pillars, people will probably notice, they're right at the entrance uh, from Montgomery Ave on Hanson Court. And unfortunately, uh, these pillars have been reported to be in a state of disrepair mm -hmm. that are now um, prompting safety concerns from people living there, especially because there's a school age children who use Montgomery and, uh, and Hanson as a um, you know bus pickup and drop off spot. So um, so I've uh, reached out to um, a the borough solicitor to find out what all the borough needs to do to you know make sure we're dotting our eyes and crossing our T's. And then in addition, I reached out to two contractors to get a sense of what the pricing would be on this. Uh, specifically. Watching the council meeting from last year, uh, the resident from Hanson Court who presented to council offered the idea of just getting rid of the pillars altogether mm -hmm. and replacing them with traditional street lights that would have far less maintenance issues. So I've spoken with them with that resident again, and uh, he's confirmed that he thinks you know the residents on Hanson Court would still be interested in that. So again, I'm working through all the legal stuff we need to do to make sure that that is in fact, you know, what should happen. And I've asked um, 
Farmer and Sons, who's doing our LED uh, streetlight installation for a quote on, um, on converting these pillars to a traditional uh, streetlight. I've also asked Keith Martin Electric, who installed our EV chargers, to take a look at it as well. And depending on the pricing we get from them, you know, we may have to go to a bid process or get more quotes or, um, or what have you. But I wanted to make sure that this committee was okay with that plan of uh, pending once we know what the actual cost would be of uh, you know, converting those pillars to, uh, to more normal street lights. Um, we, um, we own them. Like, then we don't need Pico's buy in to do this. No, so. we, um, okay. a part of the borough's purchase of the uh, street light system, um, we don't need uh, Pico's. We use those too. Right. And, um, and the solicitor and I are working out the paperwork that we need to do with the residents on Hanson to have in writing that the borough owns the pillars themselves. And we, we agreed to take ownership. I'm not sure we did anything formal exactly. to, to make that happen. But I, I think we're still, we still think that we, we should honor that. So, yeah. yeah. No, I was just concerned to make sure that people didn't have yeah. a role to play because I would really delay things for yeah. a lot of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? So I, I think I have no question about this particular operation, but uh, do we have a do we have a uh, procedure in place for requesting a streetlight? <laughs> My neighbors have asked me. Um, well, what would we do to get a streetlight on the corner of uh, Fox Hall and uh, North Windwood? I don't know what the what the answer is to that. Yeah, uh, actually, um, we do not have a process for requesting a streetlight. Um, I guess the just you know thinking long talk talking long thinking. The process would be to, you know, file a work order, almost like with traffic reports, mm -hmm. to file a work order that would then come to this committee, and then maybe I could work with the, um, you know, establish some separate uh, contract with our current lighting consultant or with our engineering team to weigh in on the, um, you know, viability of that request. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric, not to put you on the spot, but like, yeah, if someone made a request for a new street light, does would Pannoni have anyone on staff, yourself, or someone else who could like look at that request and say like, this would be helpful, this would not be helpful, this is feasible, this is not feasible? Uh, yes, we do. We have uh, you know various electrical designers and other engineers that could yeah, assess. Um, a, how you could get lighting to an intersection, and B, is it really is, would it be warranted to have light? Uh, you know, there is to a certain degree that lighting can be useful for uh, either safety reasons or you know, traffic safety reasons, but it can also come down to a certain level of how much lighting do you want, how much lighting do you not want. But the practical details we could work out. Yes. That uh, presumably wouldn't go because they would need to actually. Run uh, yeah, we'd have to file to put in a new street light. Right. Well, actually, right. yeah. uh, I mean, to make a new connection, yeah, there's an application you have to turn to Pico and then they have to approve it okay. um, and all that. You so pay them start. per, I believe you pay them per unit for electricity, a flat rate per street light. Yeah, that lovely, it's give or take like $7 per month per light plus then the electric cost of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be the process. And just speaking of hand, uh, not hands, but of, uh, of, um, of the LED street light installation, it's on the agenda for PHS, but just while we're on the topic, um, there are about uh, 20 or 30 or so lights in the borough that have not been converted to LED yet. I think including in the area that you're talking about. And, um, yeah. I've been told there are two reasons why that hasn't been done. One is certain uh, for certain streets, there have been obstructions uh, like tree branches or planters or basketball goals or things like that that have gotten in the way of the contractor. And then with the decorative style lights, which are uh, the type found on like uh, Fox Hall Lane and Hanson Court. Um, the manufacturer decided to change all their part numbers. And so when we did the contract with the manufacturer, it specified this is the part number we're ordering. 
So now our consultant is having to go back to the manufacturer oh. and figure out what new part number corresponds with the old part number that we were trying to order to make sure we get the correct lights. Okay. Hence the delay. I mean, I am hopeful that you know, on our block with the new lights in, it'll be bright enough that people won't be uh, won't feel the need for something new on the corner. But we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for the update. Uh, that's it for um, action items. So update on uh, borough projects. I'm sure. I'm sorry. What's the first item? Is the uh, stormwater bump outs. All right. So um, stormwater bump outs, not too much to say right now. Um, we're awaiting the county to actually send us the grant paperwork and grant contract still, um, because we can't actually start any work on the project until we've signed that, uh, that contract with the county. Um, but as soon as we get that, you know, uh, Eric, I believe your team will be ready to actually do, um, you know, there are designs provided, but do more detailed designs and start working up the um, bid documents and all that. Okay, I see Eric nodding. Yes. Uh, comments? All right, next item is the uh, stormwater on Haverford Avenue. Yeah, so again, um, just to remind everyone, uh, the contractor uh, thinks in March they'll have the materials they need and we'll be ready to start work on that project then. All right. And the Haverford Avenue bike pilot. Sure, yeah. So, um, Did you say March? I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm Unfortunately, yes. Wow, that's hard. <laughs> I, I couldn't hear this. So, um, myself and, uh, and Eric and the folks, uh, Kim and Jean from the North Earth uh, Cycling Club and our public works manager, Jeff, got together, uh, talked about revising the plan um, based upon the comments that we received from the North Earth Cycling Club. Uh, Eric uh, got us, uh, you know, those revisions sent back. And now uh, public works based on this plan that was in the packet is actually working to get the um, bike lane implemented. Um, right now, the uh, the yellow uh, line is there, and just today, the uh, the bike symbols were put down. I know the sign. Oh, okay, yeah. I know the signage has been ordered, and I do believe uh, later today or tomorrow the signage will be installed, and the uh, hay bales have been are being put down. Okay. So. Um, so by end of day Wednesday, it, we should have our uh, soft open on it. And uh, uh, the cycling club has talked about doing an event similar to what we did with Wheels on Windsor on uh, Saturday, December 4th, where that morning would be more of the uh, grand opening for it. A uh, good thing we have ribbon now. We'll have to get, more, uh, get some more scissors. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, that will be an opportunity to really encourage people to come out and try it out. And officials from the borough and the cycling club will be present, you know, to collect feedback in real time uh, on, uh, on the bike lane. I have a question. Sorry. I don't remember seeing the, the removal of the rolled curb and clear bike path as needed. I don't remember that from the original plan. Is that is that, that was one of the revisions that was made? Okay, yeah. so are we gonna we're gonna do that now as part of the pilot? Yeah. Okay, that's big. But I mean, it really is almost impossible to get to the bike plan with any feeling of safety with, with that there. I mean, I've tried exactly. To, it's just, yeah, you just have to get off your bike and walk or cross the street and go back. I mean, there is no. So yeah, I think that's fine. Do we have to? Do, but it'll be before December 4th, I assume. Because that's yeah, a lot of work. Yeah, I'll double check with them. Um, it looks with, like it's going to take a jackhammer. Jeff <laughs> on the timeline, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a little more involved than just putting down uh, paint. For sure. I think it's not, uh, all, we work with Jeff on that. It's not anything they can't pretty easily do. Uh, they're going to make it as clear and as smooth as they can, uh, you know, to allow bikes to get through there. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's exciting. I'll be out there on uh, December 4th. <laughs> thanks. I'm going to figure out a good place to be. I wrote down it today. To get oh, awesome. <laughs> That's right, we've got a, a, a tester. It's sort of functional. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see. I mean, I have, I have seen some bikes going down. It's also been great uh, traffic calling for Haverford Ave. Oh, yeah. immediately. Yeah. Kim Kimberly gave me a video of she was out there looking at just after the yellow line went in and she said, look at how slow the cars are going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, 
it's great. I mean, you know, they'll eventually have to wait to make the turn at the light anyway. So yeah, it's not, it's people, not really uh, slowing people down from their commute or whatever, yeah. but it is keeping it safer for, for awesome. all the you know, pedestrians and whatnot. Uh, we're at the end of our agenda, I guess. We are. We have public comment. But I, I was just thinking about that today. Exactly right at this point in the conversation. Right at this point when I was thinking about that intersection and getting to the bike path, and I was thinking about the lines of cars, and I oh, confess, well, I've had to come down that way for a couple reasons, you know, in the late afternoon a few times, yeah. and I have taken a right and gone all the way down, and the bridge is out, and gone all the way up Avon, the back way, mm -hmm. Rockland, you know, the whole back way to go over Bowman. I'm sure it doesn't save time, but I'm just not, it keeps my blood pressure down. Um, <laughs> It's, this is exactly what the borough anticipated happening. This is before I was on the council, so it's not like I personally have an axe to grind, but I know a lot of the council members and administration put a lot of time into putting together and receiving approval from PICO for a roundabout and intersection. And that moment has passed, but it's a problem. I mean, the cars are, I don't know what we, can, if there is anything if, if our traffic engineer from Pannoni has, has actually had a conversation about, gee, at this point with that light there, what can we do? Can we I mean, maybe ask for the light timing to be changed? That seems like a quick or easier possible fix. Um, I mean, I'm almost at the point of saying, do we need to make left turns out of there? I mean, do we have room to cut into our, our, our rights of ways and put a mini roundabout somewhere on the streets so the traffic can circulate and change directions? Because it's you know, at busy times of day, it's mm -hmm. it's crazy. I mean, and there's no visibility there too. And, and if emergency vehicles need to get through there, forget it. I don't know what happens if a fire truck doesn't have a bridge and can't get through there. I, I really, it, it generally concerns me. I think I think maybe looking at signal timing at rush hour, like at, at key points. I think during most of the day, it's annoying, but it's not a serious problem. But you know, at rush hour, it just tends to back up. That would be yeah. the time we need to. Yeah, I mean, if I may, as someone who regularly uh, you know, has to go through that intersection uh, between 4 and 5 o'clock each day, um, yeah, I mean, thankfully I turn right because I live in Val Kenwood, but I'll admit, even on the days after work when I need to go do something in Ardmore or something like that, I honestly turn, mm -hmm. uh, I turn right on to Montgomery and then go around like through Montgomery and then down Church Road, you know, to get mm -hmm. over onto uh, Lancaster Ave and then on West. Because again, I don't know if it really saves any time, but it feels a lot better than sitting <laughs> waiting to turn left for who knows how long. Um, so, um, and then of course, even if you're turning right, there are sideline issues when you're turning right mm -hmm. because the people trying to turn left are kind of like constantly kind of creeping up and it's tough to see when you're turning right. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, I guess for when we do, when you look, when we start to get into the active transportation plan, I mean, does that include looking at those kinds of purely traffic blocks? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, for now, maybe is how hard is it to look at light timing? Well, why don't we do this? Yeah, me and uh, me and Eric and Mike Schneider, our traffic engineer, can have a conversation about that and can report back at the next infrastructure meeting. That seems like a yeah, I don't know if it's really belongs in public health and safety or if it belongs in infrastructure, but. I don't know it is a, it's a general concern. It's a general yeah. concern. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. If, if there's a fix, it should go to all council. We should mention it because I think everybody would love yeah. to see yeah. Yeah, an improvement it, there. You know, environmentalists have pointed to the roundabout, all the environmental benefits. It, it would have been, it would have been better. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I know. But, okay. Yeah, if you can improve the light time. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> all right, do we have anything else uh, as a committee here? Otherwise, we'll open to public comment. Okay, public comment. Anyone here online? Uh, I don't think it's. I think uh, Ira was the only other person we had. So. Okay, looks like no public comment. All right, uh, meeting adjourned. Oh, wait, sorry, um, Councilmember Bush. Before we adjourn, um, what is the, just so everyone's clear, what is the date of our next meeting? Okay. It's going to be the, uh, the third uh, Tuesday. In December, so which is um, yeah, I apologize. We originally December twenty first. That's the first, if that's the third Tuesday. That doesn't sound right though. Yeah. Uh, 
I guess that's right, 21st. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's already on the calendar. Yeah, uh, 21st it should be. Uh, okay. Okay. And uh, you're, are you on vacation? I am, but I'll, uh, I'll call in. Okay. Or just write really good memos. So, uh, <laughs> Michelle. Actually, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Michelle, yeah, you're going to do that all and do that? No, we don't yeah. think you will. Yeah, you should. You yeah, should. probably want to do this. I'll write, <laughs> I'll write really good memos. Michelle will be here. Okay. Uh, Eric will be here. You'll be in good hands. Okay. That's good. And if the price yeah, comes up, time up. if the question comes up that you absolutely need an answer from me from, you know how else to get a hold of me. You can just text or call me. You know, I, you know, I think none of us know how to, know how to set up the L or the... Uh, yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle's here yeah. to, to yeah. handle that. Yeah. I thought that would be, be fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Kathy, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Good.